Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you all this morning. If any of you have not met me yet, I am Pastor Steve, and I am just super excited that you would be able to worship with us here this morning. If you have a Bible handy, I would invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians. We'll be looking at chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. This is is written by the Apostle Paul, his first letter to the church in Corinth. Hear these words. So then, about food, sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in this world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. If you've been with us at all over the last couple of weeks, you may know that we are in a teaching series right now entitled The Search for Truth. And in this series, what we're doing essentially is we are looking at our understanding of the Christian faith and we are holding that up against other faith systems, other major living world religions so that we can understand the difference, so that we can know for certain what we believe as compared to what maybe other people believe because we now live in a pluralistic society. Pluralistic means there are many different religious belief systems that exist side by side within one culture. And within the American culture, within our nation, there are people who believe in various things. I mentioned in the first week that when I grew up, everybody I knew was a Christian. Now, I know people who practice Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam. Or Judaism, right? And so we have these other world religions. And so I believe that it's important for us as Christians to have a knowledge and understanding of how others believe and think so that we can appropriately address questions, so that we can talk with people about other perspectives and how we understand Christianity in comparison to those other world religions. So we began the first week with just a a solid biblical understanding of our own Christian faith. We kind of said, you know what? It's not really about any particular denomination or branch of Christianity. Ultimately, when it comes to what we believe, it is about what the Bible says. It's about what we see in Scripture. And so we looked in that first week at a biblical understanding of our Christian theology. So if you were here or if you can even just imagine... um, what would you say are some of the core essential truths of the Christian faith? Like, we believe, fill in the blank. We believe in the Trinity. We believe that God is known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity. What else do we believe? We believe in the resurrection, right? We believe that Jesus Christ truly gave his life at the cross, was laid in the tomb, and on the third day was raised to new life and lives eternally. What else do we believe? We we believe in everlasting life, that because of what Christ has done, we can have the gift of eternal life through his sacrifice. What else? Any other thoughts? Okay, that there will be a return of Christ. Actually, we didn't even talk about that one in the first week, but that is good. There will be a a second coming of Christ, that one day he will return. Kim, what did you say? We believe in the body and blood of Christ. Okay, we believe that he genuinely sacrificed his life for us, that that was not metaphorical or anything like that, but it is true. Any other thoughts? Anything else you can think of? (laughs) Whoops. Tori is very excited to come and share with me. I just know it. She loves me. Um, anyways, actually, you know, the funny thing is in Sandown, we had two kids right here, just 
came up, started playing. It was, it was awesome. Uh, it was entertaining. If people didn't want to listen to me, they could watch the kids. It was great. All right. So anyways, the point is we, we understand our own Christian faith being these certain biblical truths. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in the, the resurrection of Christ. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, God's, God's presence with us and in us, right? We believe in salvation by faith alone, that it's not by works that we might be saved, but by the faith in Christ. And so those are some of the core beliefs. Last week, we talked about, we're, we're taking these other world religions in a chronological order, right? When they were created. And we're looking at the major living world religions. So there have been other religions in the past that are no longer really practiced in the world. But there are certain major living world religions that are still practiced to this day. Does anybody remember what the oldest of all the living world religions is? Judaism. Judaism is the oldest of all living world religions. More than 4,000 years old. It goes back to somewhere around 2100 to 2400 BC, right? Before the coming of Christ. And it is built greatly on two people, Abraham and the covenant that God gave to Abraham, promising that from him would come a great nation. And ultimately, out of that nation, a savior. And then the second person being Moses, Moses brought down the law. And so for the Jews, their whole faith is built around the law. It's built around obedience to the law. The way that we experience, if you are a Jew, the way you experience blessing in this life from God is if you've been good. You've been obedient to the law. And if you're not obedient to the law, you might expect punishment or curse in this life. And so it is very much a legalistic faith system. And so even though... There are many shared things within Christianity, uh, between Christianity and Judaism, because our faith, of course, came out of Judaism. There are some very distinct differences, right? There are certain things that are not the same between those faith systems. Probably the most important uh, is the, the understanding of who Jesus is, right? The Jews would say Jesus was a prophet. They would say he was a great teacher. He was a moral person, right? That he did good for people, right? We would say that Jesus is the the Savior, the Messiah, right? The one that had been long promised by the prophets who would come and save the world. So we see that differently. The other thing that's different for us between Judaism and Christianity, the major thing, is our understanding of the law. For the Jews, the law was about trying to earn salvation. It was about earned righteousness, right? The idea was we had to be obedient to the law, be good in that way, and by so doing, would please God, and God would uh, bless us. We as Christians do not see the law as blessing and curse. We see the law as that which helps us to identify our sin so that we understand our need for a Savior. The law for us is meant to point us to Jesus. It's meant to lead us into an understanding that we're never going to live perfect lives. None of us is ever going to be free of sin. We're never going to be able to earn our way into heaven. But we believe that the law helps us to see our sin so that we recognize our need for a Savior. So that kind of catches us up on the series. In case you've missed either of the first couple of weeks, that's where we've come from. That's where we were. Today, we're looking at the second oldest faith system in the world and the living faith system, and that is Hinduism. Now, Hinduism goes back somewhere between 1500 and 2000 BC. And the reason we say somewhere is because Hinduism is somewhat amorphic. It just sort of evolved, and it's got a very broad faith understanding, and it wasn't built on a single person or a single event. Christianity, obviously we can go back to Jesus. Judaism goes back to Moses and Abraham. And as we'll see in like um, Islam goes back to Muhammad, right? Hinduism does not do that. It was just sort of this, this collection of beliefs that sort of came together somewhere between 1500 and 2000 years ago. And so one of the key things in terms of understanding Hinduism is that it is a polytheism, Okay monotheism means you believe in one God. Polytheism means you believe in many gods or that you can worship one of many gods and it's all legitimate. It's all the same, right? Hinduism, actually, they estimate Hinduism as somewhere around 300 million gods. 
wild. Because anyone almost can sort of make up a God, create a God or envision a God, and that becomes their God, right? And so they, they, it's a polytheism. Now, in practice, almost all Hindus actually worship one of two gods, either Vishnu or Shiva. Those are the two major Hindu gods. But Hindus are free to worship any of the 300 million gods, that are in their polytheistic belief system, okay? Now, some Hindus are even what we would call pantheistic. The difference between polytheism, meaning worship multiple gods, and pantheism, pantheism is to say that they believe that God is in everything and that everything is God. So a polytheist would say there's a God of the sun and a God of the moon and a God of the trees and a God of the river. Pantheists would say God is in the sun and the moon and the trees and the river and the river and the moon and the sun and the trees are God. So you understand the difference? But Hindus can believe in either. They can believe in a polytheism. They can believe in a pantheism. And it's all okay. Because there is no defined theological belief system to Hinduism. Right? It is very, very diverse based on which God you worship and how you choose to worship that God. However, there are certain key things that transcend all of the gods right? in Hinduism. So there are certain things that kind of hold all that together. The first of those is a belief in reincarnation. Hindus believe in reincarnation. You probably know reincarnation is the idea that after we've lived our life on this earth, our soul comes back around and gets put into another body. Okay? And so they would say that every lifetime we come back around and we put into another body. Now, the interesting thing is uh, you can actually come back around uh, in a number of forms. You can come back around in another human form. You can actually come back around in the form of an animal or even a plant in Hinduism or even an inanimate object. Okay? And so your soul, what the Hindus can, right, their Atman must repeat thousands of cycles of life and come back and come back and come back and each time they come back in a different form or category, okay? And so this process for the Hindus of being reincarnated over and over and over again is called the great wheel of samsara, okay? That's this understanding that we're born over. Hindus would believe that they might live thousands, maybe even millions of lives before they get off the great wheel of samsara that before they can escape this endless cycle of being born again and born again and born again. And so their goal, their goal is to eventually eventually achieve what they call moksha, M-O-K-S-H-A. Moksha is when you finally get to escape the wheel of samsara and stop coming back. And so the closest idea they have to heaven is to stop being born again and again and again and be able to escape this wheel of constant reincarnation of constant reincarnation. And the reason is that, you know, I think sometimes we, you know, we hear about reincarnation. I think most have heard of that. I think some of us think, oh, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? You know, I get to come back in a new life. I get to be somebody different and, and maybe even somebody really cool this time or whatever. You know, like, like that's some blessing. But for the Hindus, it's not. The Hindus see life as suffering. And so their goal in life is to come back in a higher and higher life form until they can finally achieve moksha. Until they can finally escape this cycle of being born again and again and again and again into a life of suffering. And when they finally do achieve that, they believe that what happens is their soul, their Atman, becomes one with eternity. And so 
this idea of this eternity is what they call Brahma. So you might even have heard that word Brahma, right? And so Brahma is sort of like the closest thing they have to an overarching God, but it's not a personal God. Not the way we think of God, right? It's more just the universe, say, or all of eternity, right? And so that's the closest thing they have to heaven. It's the idea that they achieve moksha. They get to get off the wheel of samsara. They get to be one with Brahma and basically cease to exist. Their soul just merges into the eternal and they get to stop the endless cycle of being born into suffering lives. So that's one of the really big, this idea of reincarnation is a big part of the belief system. Another core belief, and you've probably heard this word, is karma, right? Now, karma is basically the law of cause and effect, right? It's a system of merit and demerit that is built into the Hindu belief system. What we might think of in the Christian faith as, as blessing and curse, right? Now, I think most of us have heard of the concept of karma. And when we think of karma, we often think of it all within this lifetime, right? Like we think, oh yeah, you know, that person did some really bad things, but wait. Because karma is, well, never mind, I won't say that. Um, (laughs) But you know that the, the theory, the way we might think of karma is to think, well, they're gonna get there someday, right? That's not exactly where the Hindus see karma. Karma for them is, that what they did in their previous life affects who they are in this life, how they came back into this world, and how they live in this life will impact how they come back in their next life. And so their goal is to have all the good karma, build all the good karma they can in this lifetime and in every successive lifetime so that they are elevated in life form to the point where they can eventually get off the wheel. Right, And so that's the concept of karma for them. It's not so much something that happens within this lifetime, but it's something that impacts each successive life. And so this kind of leads us into another important concept within Hinduism, and that is the caste system. Right? You may have heard of that, C-A-S-T-E. The caste system is this idea of social stratification, social structure that is built into Hinduism that basically has four castes, in a way five, but they really call it four, consider it four. And what happens is you are born into one of four castes. And whatever caste you are born into is how you must live your life, right? And so there's no moving from caste to caste within this lifetime. You are born into a certain caste. That's how you must live your life. That caste will determine um, how you live, what work you can do, who you can marry, what education you're allowed to have. Uh, All of that is determined by your caste. And whatever caste you're born into is what you will have in this lifetime. So you can see how Hinduism can become fatalistic. Right? And how actually it can be seen as suffering. Because there's no real hope for quote unquote advancement, if you will. Like we can better ourselves or we can work hard and move to a, a you know a, something nicer or what they are they are to live within their caste for this lifetime. And so there are four primary castes. I honestly have a hard time pronouncing them all. I'll just be honest with you. But I will describe them to you. The highest caste, I can say this one, are the Brahmins. The Brahmins are the priests. That is considered the highest life form, if you will, for a Hindu. The next one down is called the Kshatriya. Begins with a K. Don't know how that works. And that is the rulers and the warriors fall into that caste. And it's a caste, the second caste below um, the priest. The third caste Uh, what's called the Kaishya, are the merchants, the business people, the skilled workers, the tradespeople. And then the lowest caste, um, the Shudra, are the unskilled workers, the laborers, the slaves. Okay? And so 
Within each of those castes, there are subcastes. And so the idea is, as you come from life to life to life to life, you might be able to move yourself up slightly from subcast to subcast to subcast till maybe you jump to the next caste and the next and the next and eventually reach moksha, where you get to be freed from the wall, from the wheel, right? Now, I said there were actually four, sort of five castes. That's because there's also a fifth category that is called the untouchables. The untouchables in Hinduism do the filthiest jobs. They drink polluted water. They eat rotted food. They are essentially slaves. And they are seen as subhuman in Hinduism. That's why they're not actually considered a caste because they're not considered really a human category. So you can literally be born into any of those castes or systems, including the untouchables. Now, officially, in 1947, the nation of India, which is where there are many, many Hindus, the nation of India outlawed discrimination against the untouchables. So legally, that category does not exist anymore. But in practice, particularly in the smaller villages, out in the rural areas, um, the caste system, including this idea of there being untouchables, still exists. And keep in mind that the higher the caste, the smaller the group. So there are many, many untouchables. And there are many uh, unskilled laborers. And then there are lesser skilled laborers and even fewer rulers and just a handful of priests. And so most Hindus are in the fourth or fifth category. And so this is why they see life as suffering. They are in the worst category in society and they're trapped. They're not allowed to move up from within that category. And so the whole goal of life is to have enough good karma that you can take a little step up in your next lifetime. This is how the system works, where they work and work and work until they can eventually reach moksha. Now, there are certain things that they believe they can do to help accelerate their journey, to help them get closer to moksha sooner. And there are basically what they call three pathways. The first pathway is the pathway of works or duty. And in the shortest version, I would just say it means living out your caste to the very best of your ability. If you were, if you were born as a servant, then you're going to be the best servant possible. You're going to work really hard. You're going to follow all the rules. You're going to do exactly what you're supposed to do within your caste. And if you do, you're going to come back. You're going to build good karma and come back in a better category. The second pathway is the pathway of knowledge. This is actually the most difficult. It's a life of self-renunciation. It's a life of meditation, extreme physical expression through yoga. Yoga actually was born out of Hinduism. Okay, I don't know if you knew that. But in Hinduism, yoga is a spiritual practice. And there are extremes to it in terms of the physical expressions of it. And so through a life of contemplation and self-denial and and intensive uh, yoga and all of that mental realization, they actually believe they can get to a place of higher consciousness that allows them to come back in a higher caste. This, however, is the hardest pathway. Very few Hindus pursue the pathway of knowledge, right? Many will try the pathway of duty, or most of them actually pursue the third pathway, which is a pathway of passionate devotion. What this means is whatever God, whatever Hindu God you choose to worship, you worship that God fervently. You worship that God with all you've got. Do all the spiritual practices. Do all the, the praying or the, the, the food that you're supposed to eat or whatever. They'll do everything they can to be the best adherent to that particular God that they can be, believing that if they work hard enough at their spiritual practices, they will come back in a higher caste or subcaste. 
And that's actually the pathway that most of them pursue. That's the one that most pursue. Now, I said at the beginning, there are millions of gods and they can pursue the path of spiritual uh, pursuit, uh, passionate devotion, they say, um, to any god. Doesn't matter which god. Any of the 300 million gods, you can pursue any one of them. Just do it passionately. Now, in practice, most of them are going to pursue a worship of Shiva or Vishnu. Those are the two primary gods. Now, there's actually a lot more fine details to Hinduism because each of the beliefs and each of the gods each, all have their own little practices and what have you, and we wouldn't begin to have time to go over all of it. But these are the big things. Reincarnation, karma, and the caste system are the things that are and the three pathways that lead to moksha, right? Um, these are sort of the most important things. So, let's stop and look at what Hindus believe versus what we believe as Christians. And are there similarities? Where are the differences? The reality is there are very few, if any, similarities between Hinduism and Christianity. So, Every once in a while, I will hear someone say, I think all religions are basically the same. Oh, I do. I hear people say that. And they'll say, you know what? It's like a mountain. And there are different paths, different trails, but they all lead to the same peak. I don't know if you ever heard someone say that or some analogy like that, right? But the truth is they're not. And when we look particularly at Hinduism, you're going to see that not all paths can possibly lead to the same place, right? They're just not the same. When you put them alongside, there are conflicting beliefs between Hinduism and Christianity. All right, and so let's talk about some of those conflicting beliefs. One of them is about how they see God. First of all, they're polytheistic and we're monotheistic. Right? Pretty big difference, actually, that you worship one God, you can worship any God or multiple gods, right? Also, uh, their supreme God, Brahma, is an impersonal God. That is to say, you cannot have a relationship with Brahma. Brahma is just the eternity, right? And so we believe as Christians that we love and serve a personal God, a God that we can pray to and talk to. A God who is with us. A God who cares about us. Uh, Brahma doesn't care about any Atman. There's no no personal God to care. Right? Our God is a God of of creation. Our God is a God of love. Our God is a God of intimacy. Right? Uh, We are able to have a personal relationship with our God. We can pray and know that God hears us and we can talk with God and we've, we've seen examples of ways that God even speaks back to us. And so that's one of the major differences. When you think about this, this eternal God in Hinduism, Brahma, probably the closest thing I can think of to compare it would be to say, may the force be with you. And I don't mean that as a joke, really. If you think about Star Wars and how they always talked about the force, right? It was like that that external power out there. But it wasn't a personal God, right? That's kind of how they see Brahma as their supreme overarching God, right? Another big difference is in terms of how we live this life. I want to read to you. Uh, passage from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The author writes, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face the judgment, so Jesus was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. One of the very important differences, essential differences, is the difference between resurrection and reincarnation. We believe, as Christians, that we are meant to live one life. This life, here and now, is the one life that we're going to live on this earth. And when it's done, we will stand before God. And we will be held accountable for our sin. 
And if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then, then Christ will stand as an intermediary with us and God, and he will cover the sin that we have had by his sacrifice. For the Hindus, they believe that they will live many lives, thousands of lives. Related to that, another difference is one similarity. Christians and Hindus both believe in a soul. Hindus call it an Atman, right? But the question is, what becomes of our soul, right? For the Hindu, the best you can hope for is to get off the wheel of samsara and become one with the creation and cease to exist. That's the best you can hope for. As Christians, we believe our soul will live eternally with God or separated from God based on our choice to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior or not. That's a very important, significant difference. Uh, as, you know, as Christians, as I mentioned, we, we believe in a monotheism versus a polytheism. Um, maybe, maybe one of the biggest distinctions in terms of how we actually live our lives here is the way we see life, our view of life, and the way a Hindu sees life. For the most part, Hindus see life as something to be endured. They understand life to be suffering. And their goal is to come back in a life that is a little less suffering. We believe life is a gift from God. We believe that life is precious. We believe that we're here for a purpose. We believe that God's created us uniquely to do his job. For, for a Hindu, they are trapped in, a, in an existence that they cannot have any choice in. There's no free will, right? They are born into a caste, and that's the caste that they're going to live and die in, right? We would say we have a free will, and with this life, we can do great things, and that life is a gift, and that we're meant, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and life abundant, right? For us, life is a blessing, For them, life is something to be endured. It is greatly suffering. And their goal is to just not have to live anymore. To not not have to come back again and again and again. And so, there are significant differences. It's important for us to understand what it means to, to believe in one faith system versus another. And to push past this this idea that that they're all the same and it doesn't really matter which path we follow if i decide to become a hindu and and follow this path then that's cool for me and if you decide to become uh, this uh, no it does matter it matters for eternity and it matters for how we live this life on earth i believe that this life is a gift from god I believe this life is a blessing and it is meant to be lived to the fullest. And I believe by free will, God has given us the opportunity to make the most of this life, to use this life, to do great things, to bless others, to to love people, to serve, right? And and to achieve and, and to seek after and pursue things in this life. And so, it's important for us to choose what we will believe. We can't just believe it all. And it can't be, as we talked about in the first week, it can't be a cafeteria system. Well, I'm going to take some of Christianity, but I kind of like that reincarnation thing, so I'm going to take some of that, and then I'll take a little bit of this. No. Ultimately, we have to choose what we will believe. In the words of Joshua, he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I invite you today to think about what you want to believe, what you choose to pursue. I pursue a life that follows Christ and that believes that life is a gift and that believes that we're meant to live this life but once and then to spend eternity with God for those who have accepted Christ. Do you join me in prayer?
Lord, I thank you for this conversation. Some of these belief systems are strange to us. They're very, very different from what we may have grown up knowing and believing. But it's important that we understand those differences. It's important that we can answer questions. It's important that when when a friend of ours says, I think all paths take us to the same place, that we can help them see that there are, in fact, very different paths and help us to be able to share with them a pathway to hope and healing and salvation and eternal life through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, as the praise team leads us in our final song, I invite us to stand and sing together. As we do, the the rails are open. If you'd like to take some time in prayer, you're welcome to bring your offering and connection cards, prayer requests, and all that to the front. Let's stand, let's sing.